Well, good evening and welcome to Grace Baptist Church in Perth. Thank you very much for joining with us on our broadcast this evening, this Sunday evening. Thank you for joining with us on Facebook or YouTube. Uh, whatever you may be joining with us on, we do pray that the Lord will bless you. We do pray that the Lord has blessed you already today in, in your own congregations. Maybe you've met this morning physically and you do not have a meeting this evening. We just thank you for joining with us. And again, we do pray that you will be edified and you'll be built up and that the Lord will be glorified as we come round his word this evening. And as we do that, um, just a few announcements for our, our own folks in church. Uh, this coming um, Wednesday, sorry, this coming Thursday is our prayer meeting and Bible study at half past seven on Zoom. So it's half past seven on Zoom um, and we'll be continuing in our studies in the book of Psalms, in the book of Psalms this Thursday evening. Next Sunday um, is our communion Sunday. We will be having communion on Sunday morning. And if you want more details of that there, certainly contact us on, on Facebook or on our website. And we can certainly pass on those details to you. Next Sunday evening, um, we have a guest speaker. Well, we, we pray that we have a guest speaker. At uh, this particular moment in time, we, that is the plan. Uh, Josh uh, Truesdale from uh, Northern Ireland, a friend of ours in Perth. He will be speaking for us next Sunday evening. And we just pray that the Lord will uh, bless him and bless us as he comes with God's word for us next Sunday evening. Those are all the announcements and as we know that they are in the will of the Lord. If we can just come before the Lord uh, this evening in prayer and ask for his help as we come round his mighty word. Let us pray. Our gracious God, our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you that this is your day that you have set aside. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that already this morning that many of us have been in church, physically been in church. And Heavenly Father, we have worshipped you. And we thank you for that opportunity. We thank you that we were able to do that, to sing praises to you and to hear your word being proclaimed. Heavenly Father, we just ask that you will be continue to be with us this evening as we meet round in, in this fashion on Facebook and on YouTube. Heavenly Father, we would just pray that, as we say so often on a Sunday evening, we're in different places, different parts of the country, um, different, in fact, different countries. But Heavenly Father, as people join and, and listen in, Lord, we would just pray that the Spirit of God will fill that room, fill that place where they are, fill their hearts. Lord, that we may be able to see what you would want us to see, understand what you would have us to do with what we hear tonight. So, Heavenly Father, we just pray that the Spirit of God will just descend upon this place and every place that someone is listening. And, Heavenly Father, that your work will continue to be done through the Spirit of God. Heavenly Father, just help me this evening as I come to this passage. Help me to be able to explain it correctly, apply it correctly but heavenly father once more lord that your son will be exhausted through exalted through it that is our prayer so heavenly father we just pray for these things this evening be with each and every one of us and heavenly father as we go into next week lord we would just pray that you would bring into remembrance these things that we've heard today maybe this morning and and especially this evening lord you would bring them to remember so that we can bring them forward to next week that, that lord we will be able to to speak a word into someone's life, that to, to witness to someone, to, to encourage someone uh, because of what we've heard, but because our faith is in Christ, in Christ alone. So Heavenly Father, just be with us tonight. Help us. And we ask these things in our Saviour's name, his worthy and strong name. Amen. Amen. We're going to continue on in our series in the book of Joshua. And we're going to look at Joshua chapter 11 this evening. Joshua chapter 11. Now this is the this is the conquest of the northern kingdoms or northern Canaan, northern part of Canaan. Joshua chapter 11 and we're going to break into the story at verse 15. Verse 15 of Joshua chapter 11. This is the word of the Lord. Just as the Lord had commanded Moses his servant, so Moses commanded Joshua, 
And so Joshua did. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord had commanded Moses. So Joshua took all that land, the hill country and all the Negeb and all the land of Goshen and the lowland and the Arabah and the hill country of Israel and its lowland. From Mount Halak, which rises towards Seir, from as far as Balgad in the valley of Lebanon, below Mount Hermon, and he captured all their kings and struck them and put them to death. Joshua made war a long time with all those kings. There was not a city that made peace with the people of Israel, except the Hivites, the inhabitants of Gibeon. They took them all in battle. For it was a Lord's doing to harden their hearts, that they should come against Israel in battle, in order that they should be devoted to destruction and should receive no mercy, but be destroyed, just as the Lord commanded Moses. And Joshua came at that time and cut off the Anakim from the hill country, from Hebron, from Deber, and from Ahab, Anab, and from all the hill country of Judah, and from all the hill country of Israel. Joshua devoted them to destruction with their cities. There was none of the Anakim left in the land of the people of Israel. Only in Gaza, in Gath and in Ashdod did some remain. So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord had spoken to Moses. And Joshua gave it for an inheritance to Israel according to their tribal allotments. And the land had rest from war. Amen. We'll end our reading at the end of the chapter and verse 23. So far up to this point, what we have seen is Joshua has a great tactical mind. He's a great warrior, but with a great mind as well. He, he and the nation have crossed over the River Jordan and they've went on and they've captured Jericho, which is a strategic location. It splits the promised land into two, the southern part and the northern part. And in chapter 10, we saw the conquest of the southern kings, the southern kingdoms. And how with the Lord's help, which was miraculous, the Joshua and the nation overcame them. There was hailstones, them, the sun, the moon uh, stood still in the, in the heavens. And now in chapter 11, we see a summary of the capture or the defeat of the, the northern kingdoms, the northern part of Canaan. And one thing we must realise that this isn't a short campaign. Yes, it has been summarised over chapter 10 and chapter 11, just two chapters. But it didn't take months for this to happen. This took years for this conquest to happen. Approximately seven years for this to happen. So this was a long and arduous operation, gruelling and difficult at times, no doubt. The land that they were conquering was vast. It was a large plot of land there was rough terrain there was smooth terrain but also there was rough terrain for them to go over and they were met with resistance they had to fight the kings of the land that they were up against just did not rule over they put up a struggle and this fight lasted as i said for seven years or as scripture records in verse 18 joshua made war a long time with all those kings. Seven years. Now, as we know, victory was assured to, to Israel and to Joshua. God had promised Joshua and the nation that the land would be theirs. And the Lord would achieve this. But Israel had to play their part in this. And the first thing I want to look at this evening is a recurring theme that we've already seen in the book of Joshua. But it recurs again here. And I want to look at it again. Look at verse 15 with me. Just as the Lord had commanded Moses, his servant, so Moses commanded Joshua and so Joshua did. He left nothing undone for all that the Lord had commanded Moses. He left nothing undone. So once more in this portion of scripture, we see the importance of obedience. Here we read in this verse, it, when we read this, it actually doesn't matter how many chariots Joshua has. It doesn't matter how many horses he has in his stable. It doesn't matter how big his tent is in the middle of the camp. 
What matters is as he's obedient to God. That's the important thing. And not just obedient to God, but everything that God has commanded him to do, even through Moses. And because he is faithful to God, he can faithfully lead the nation to victory, the victory that God has promised them. But let us understand something at this point. Being obedient to God pleases God. Today more than ever, that should be what we aim to do as a Christian, is to please our Heavenly Father. That's what we should be wanting to do. To be obedient. And because of that obedience, it pleases Him. Do you remember what Christ Himself said in the Gospel of John? In John chapter 8 and verse 28. In fact, turn with me to John chapter 8. And John 8, 28. We've had this ready. And this is Christ speaking. And Jesus said to them, this is verse 28. Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the son of man, then you will know that I am he. And that I, I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the father taught me. Verse 29. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. Christ here is telling his listeners, you do not know who I am, but when I'm lifted up, when I'm crucified, you will realize the one that you have despised, the one that you have hated, the one that you have ridiculed, is actually the one that you should have fell down flat on your faces and worshipped. And here Christ also is telling them that he is doing this because this is the will of the Father and he is pleasing his heavenly Father by being obedient. Listen, if Christ, when he was on this earth, wanted to please his Father, was obedient to the, the Father's will, how much more should we be obedient to him? Being obedient to him and what he calls us to do. Listen, so often we go to scripture and we'll say, yes, I'll do that. Yes, yes, I'll do that. Yes, I'm obedient to that command. Yes, I do that. Yes. Especially when it comes to the big things, isn't it? Those big things, those things that other people will see that they're obvious that we're being obedient to God in these things. The problem with many people today, the problem with many Christians today is they do not look at the small things. Small things that God's word tells us to do also. Not to gossip, not to be greedy, not to be proud, not to be jealous, not to be angry, not to tell lies. Sometimes we forget about those things. Those are acceptable things in our lives, acceptable sins in our lives. In Titus, in chapter 3 of Titus, and this is Paul, the Apostle Paul speaking to Titus. And he says this in chapter 3. Remind them to be submissive, submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarrelling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy towards all people, all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and the loving kindness of God, our Saviour, appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. That passage is a sermon in itself, isn't it? But listen, if you're not obedient to the word of God in the big, big things as well as the small things, then there is an issue. There is an issue. And because of that, you will not have full victory in this life. You will not be a witness for Christ in this life. Make no mistake here. People watch you. They look at you. 
maybe even more than ever before because of this lockdown and all this, the stresses and the strains and the pressures that come upon each and every one of us. Maybe they're looking at you more than ever before to see how you react, how you react to certain situations. They want to see how you talk about certain situations, about maybe the authorities that are in power at the moment, especially when there's no other Christians around about. We find Joshua's faithfulness in his obedience to God. And it did not come from himself. It wasn't a quality that he dragged out of himself. It comes from his trust in and a God who is faithful. A God who made the nation promises and, and, and a God who kept those promises. Joshua knows that God intimately. And he is obedient to him because he knows it pleases him. If you're a Christian tonight, is that you? Are you obedient to God because you know it pleases him? Do you want to please God today? Yes, it's okay, it's okay to do, as I said this morning, to feed the hungry and with a soup kitchen or feed the hungry with a food bank. Of course it is. It's good to help those who are less fortunate than ourselves. I said that this morning. Of course it is. And there are many people would see that when they do that, they're being, they will say, I'm actually being a doer of the word, not just a hearer. Yeah, and that's true. That, that's true. But if you want to please God, you are to be obedient to God first and foremost. And everything, the big and the small. Next thing I want to look at this evening from this portion of scripture is that sin results in death. Not a great headline, is it? But sin <laughs> results in death. In the first few verses of this chapter, which we didn't read, which we didn't read, we see a great coalition come together more than the coalition of the southern kingdoms there's stronger kings there's more kings they have more men to come against israel verse four look what it says in verse four and they came out with all their troops a great horde in number like the sand that was on the seashore with very many horses and chariots so this is a, a multitude this is a great number of men and chariots and horses that are coming against israel here but here's the thing Yes, they had many troops. But here's the thing. The kings would have known what has just happened. They would have known the history of the nation of Israel. They've seen this already. They knew that, that their God delivered them out of bondage and out of slavery, slavery from Egypt. We see, that, we see that Rahab knew this. The inhabitants of Jericho knew this. So these kings would have known that. These kings would have also known that God made a way to cross the river Jordan when it was, was fully flooded. They would have heard about how Jericho had fallen to Joshua, miraculously fallen to Joshua. They would have heard how the southern kingdom had just fallen. Those kingdoms had just fallen. They would have heard again, no doubt, how the sun and the moon and the skies stopped moving. They would have heard how many of those soldiers had fell victim to large hailstones that fell from God's sky. They would have known that God was on Joshua's side, that God, their God was on Israel's side. And yet, and yet they think they can stop God and Joshua. Now, if we were to read these first five verses of chapter 11 and we didn't look at anything else or read anything else, we would look and think these kings are foolish men. These are foolish men. How on earth have they survived so long as kings of their own land? Because there's no discernment here. There's no wisdom in making such a decision. Surely they know that they're on a hiding to nothing. But look at what it says in verse 20. For it was the Lord's doing to harden their hearts that they should come against Israel in battle in order that they should be devoted to destruction and should receive no mercy but be destroyed, just as the Lord commanded Moses. Excuse me. This was the sovereign hand of God on display once more. And because of that, they would be utterly destroyed. Because the Lord had hardened their hearts, 
they would be utterly destroyed. Now pause for a moment. Think about that. And ask yourself the question. How do you feel about that? How, how does that make you feel? Knowing that the Lord had devoted them to destruction. He would hardened their hearts to come and battle against Israel. How does that make you feel? There are many today who would tell you that the God of the Old Testament is not the God of the New Testament. They're totally different. They run to the New Testament and say, listen, look, look, listen. This is a God of love that we serve today. There's a God of love in the New Testament. They do not want to deal with the fact that God is sovereign. They do not want to deal with the fact that God punishes sin. And what we have in front of us is that God has lost his patience with the Canaanites. They had continued in their disobedience to God. They had rejected God, not in a one-off act, for, for decades, for centuries. They had continued in their sin, continued in their idolatry. And God gives them up. He gives them over to their lusts. And now God punishes that sin with death, annihilation. God is purging the land here. He's getting rid of all this idolatry. He's getting rid of all this sin. But please listen. This does not give the Canaanites an excuse. As I've just said, for years they had rejected God. But for years their hearts, their, their desires of their heart was to do evil and to do more evil. They had no desire to turn to God. They had no desire to be saved. The wages of their sin was certainly death. And not just a physical death. This was a spiritual death, which is far more worse, far worse than taking your last physical breath. We must remember, it is important to remember, that God is a God of love. Of course he is. He is a God of love. But also, he is a God who is a just God. He is a sovereign God who will execute justice. He will not indulge those who sin. Sin will not go unpunished. If God allowed that to happen, if God allowed just to turn a blind eye to sin, then he would be unjust. But all of God's ways are just. God has not, cannot, will not show favoritism or partiality to those who sin. He won't. Colossians 3 Verse 25, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done. And there is no partiality. Listen tonight, if you have rejected God, and I don't mean you don't believe in him. I mean you have rejected him. He is not Lord of your life. If you live in and love your sin, if you've not repented of your sin, then God will judge you. He will judge you because he is a just God. And because he is a loving God, he has to be a just God. He has appointed a day that he will judge this world. He's appointed a day that he will judge you just as he judged the Canaanites. In Genesis 15, 16, we read of them. It says this in Genesis 15. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation from the iniquity of the Amorites, is, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. The Amorites are the Canaanites. Their total destruction, their death comes because of their sin. For many years they had continued on in their sin. But up until this time God had, had been gracious. He'd been long suffering. And now there could be no more. Their sin had to be judged. Now the list of their sins are atrocious. If you study the scriptures, they're atrocious. There's child sacrifice. There's bestiality. There's adultery. There's incest. Now you're probably saying, those are atrocious, Joe. Joe. They're, they're, they're terrible. But they're nothing to do with me. They're not like me. I would never do anything like that there. But listen, again, scripture is clear. We have all sinned. Maybe not those sins, 
but we all have sin. Sin is universal. And from the very beginning of Scripture in the book of Genesis, we see that the world, the earth, was corrupt in the sight of God. For all flesh had corrupted their way on this earth. They did what was right in their own eyes. They turned against God. They rebelled against God. Romans chapter 3.10 tells us, quoting from the Psalms, None is righteous, no, not one. No one is righteous. That includes me. That includes you this evening. Now, again, you may think to yourself, well, actually, Joe, you know, I'm much better than these Canaanites. I'm much better than most of the people that go to church, actually, Joe. I give more. I do more for the community. Well, maybe that, that well might be the case. You may do those things. But in the eyes of a holy God, you are not righteous. The only way you can stand before a holy God is, being, is by being clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Look at verse 21 with me. And Joshua came at that time and cut off the Anakim uh, from the hill country, from Hebron, from Debir, and from Ahab, Ahab, and from all the hill country of Judah, and from all the hill country of Israel. Joshua devoted them to destruction with their cities. Now, as we read this as a whole chapter in context, this actually, this portion of scripture, this particular verse, may seem a bit out of place. Why is it put there at the end? Surely that should have been further on or further back or at the beginning of this particular chapter. Well, it's there to remind us that these people were the ones that the 12 spies saw when they went out to spy on the promised land. Remember how the 12 went out and 10 came back with a bad report? And it was only Joshua and Caleb that came back with a good report? These people, these giants that we're talking about here, the Anakim, these giants put fear into the hearts of the ten. And because of that, they wandered in the wilderness. But now, even they were devoted to destruction, exterminated for all time. Joshua and Israel had completed the conquest. The land was now theirs. Yes, we see in the next chapter there are some parts of the promised land that still need to be conquered and that will happen. But for the most part, the conquering had been done. What had been started off so many years ago, when the twelve went to spy on the land, on the promised land, had now come to an end. The nation received its inheritance. They were now able to experience the promise of God. The land was purged of idolatry, and now the nation would be able to occupy those cities that they had not burned. But also build new cities and erect homes. Remember they'd only ever had tents before. They were constantly moving. Now they would be able to build their own homes. Grow their own crops. Cultivate the land. Worship their God in their land. A, a land that God himself had promised. And that does not mean everything is hunky-dory. It does not mean that everything is a bed of roses for them. They still go through struggles and conflicts. Nation after nation rise against Israel. And that's a bit like the Christian today. Even though we are saved. Even though we are promised an inheritance and an eternal hope. We still go through struggles. We still go through pains. We still go through conflicts and struggles in our life. But ultimately, like the nation of Israel, just like them, we will find rest in what God has promised us. That is our eternal home in heaven with him. But even as we know that, we must be aware that there is a spiritual warfare out there that we have to engage in. It's all around about us each and every day. We cannot deny that. It's a, a battle that we cannot hide from. But it's a battle that we will win. Not because of anything that we have done or can do. No, no but because of Christ and all that he has done. He's done it. He secured that victory for us. And because of that, we will find peace. We will find comfort. We will find security. Just as the nation of Israel did in the promised land. 
and the Lord will strengthen us against those fiery darts of the devil, against those trials and against those temptations. And we will find that security, that comfort and that eternal rest in our eternal hope in Christ. In conclusion tonight, so far we have seen so many wonderful truths in this book. I don't know many sermons we've done, but there are so many wonderful truths that we have looked at and many more that we haven't looked at. We have seen that God is a faithful God. We've seen he is a God that keeps his promises, keeps his promises to those who are obedient to him, who follow his commands. We've seen God, a God who is miraculous, a God who has the power over his creation, the very creation that he breathed into life. We see that he is a sovereign God. He has control of every aspect of this world and every aspect of your life and my life. He has control of that. And everything that works out in your life will work out for his glory. Be assured of that. And we've seen that even as he's purged this land, he's purged, purged it of idolatry, he has got rid of the sin, he's purged out the kings and the cities and the nations. It shows us that God is a God who cannot look at sin. He cannot look at sin. Tonight he cannot look at your sin. Tonight he either looks at you through the eyes of Christ, if you're saved. And he sees you clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Just like Rahab who we saw a number of weeks ago. How she turned from her wicked way. The wicked ways of her people. She turned from that and she put her trust in God. The God of Israel. And God was gracious and merciful to save her. Or tonight as he looks at you he sees you as a rebel. Someone who is devoted to destruction. Voted, are devoted to destruction because of their sin because of your sin we said earlier on that the wages of sin is death if your sin has not been covered by the blood of Christ if you have not went to the cross and you went to Christ and begged him for forgiveness of your sins then your end will be just as the Canaanites but you won't be annihilated yes you will die but you will live for all eternity in a place called hell. Hell is not a p place that has been made up to scare you. Hell is real. And if you die in your sin, that is where you're going to end up. Listen, God did not spare the angels when they sinned. What did he do with them? When those angels in heaven sinned, what did he do with them? He cast them into hell. He will do the same with you. Hell's mouth is wide open. Hell's mouth is wide open and its appetite is never satisfied. It wants to devour you. Christ is your tonight is your only means of escape. Turn to him. Call to him. Repent of your sins. Be obedient to God. And if you do that, you will have an eternal inheritance. A place where there will be no more hurt. In a place where there will be no more hunger, no more thirst. In a place where there will be no more death. You will not mourn. It will be a place where there will be no more sin. But it will be a place where we will worship God for all eternity. We will serve God for all eternity. We will have perfect fellowship with God and our fellow believers. We will have perfect rest for all eternity. Amen. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for your word this evening. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are a sovereign God. But Heavenly Father, that you are a just God. You're a merciful God. And Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have not got what we deserved yet. Lord, if we were to be given what we deserved, it would be death right now. We don't even deserve to have our next breath. And yet, Lord, you're merciful and gracious to grant us that extension. Lord, Heavenly Father, we just pray tonight that those who do not know Christ as their Saviour will realise that. That they're living on borrowed time. 
that one day quite possibly you will just like as you dealt with the Canaanites you will say no more no more your sin has has filled the cup it is overflowing the cup and now I have to deal with it oh heavenly father we pray that that is not the case for those who are listening and do not know Christ as their saviour Lord we thank you that you are a just God we thank you heavenly father for that we thank you, Heavenly Father, that you sent your Son to take our place on Calvary's tree, to shed his blood. Heavenly Father, we thank you for that. Lord, we just pray that tonight, Lord, that your word goes forth and it will speak into the hearts of those who are not saved, but also it will speak into the hearts of those who are saved. That, Heavenly Father, our obedience to you is so important. Heavenly Father, your word tells us to be obedient. It tells us to be obedient in the big things, but also in the little things. And so often, Heavenly Father, we can look at those little things and say, ah, well, they don't matter. No one will see those things if I, if I don't obey them. But Heavenly Father, you see them. Heavenly Father, teach us to be obedient in everything that we do. So it glorifies you. Lord, we ask these things in our Saviour's name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you once more for joining with us at Grace Baptist in Perth. We thank you for spending this time with us. We do pray that the Lord has blessed you. And stay with us just that little bit longer. We have another item of worship just now. Um, another hymn with the words coming up. And stay and just meditate upon them and sing out loud. As many of our churches are not doing that at the moment. Um, but sing out loud and sing praises to our God. Thank you again for joining with us. And may the Lord bless you this week. Thank you.